Well, it's a warm day, so uh, let's talk about fire. Did you ever play with fire when you were a kid, whether it was, uh, you know, a pack of matches or a lighter or a campfire or even a stove in the kitchen? Uh, these things can bring pain. But fire can do more than burn. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning as we look at Malachi chapter 3. Good morning and welcome to worship, you who are here. Most of you are over here, so if you see me looking this way, it's because most of the people are over here for some reason, which is fine. We're just glad you're here. Um, Glad you're here too. You too, everybody. Uh, At any rate, my name is Jeff Loach. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's Church, and I welcome you uh, wherever you are watching us uh, online or in person. Uh, You can hit the like, subscribe, notification bell, all those things that'll keep you familiar with what we're up to around here. And you can use the comment stream on YouTube or use the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I will be thrilled to be able to keep in touch with you. It's good to be together, joined as one in the power of the Holy Spirit as we worship the Lord. Now next Sunday, our permissible capacity goes up to 25%. Um... And trust me, yeah, trust me, there's room for you here if you are not here. Uh, there is room now. If, if you want to hurry, you could get here in time for the message. Uh, so if you have been watching online, you haven't been coming, uh, we would encourage you to come. It would uh, be great to see you in person. Uh, this being the Sunday closest to Canada Day, I invite you to rise wherever you are. And if you are able, and uh, we're going to sing the national anthem, followed by Albert Durant Watson's hymn for Canada called Lord of the Lands. Please stand.
Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Let's worship him together. Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46, parable of the evil farmers. Now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landover, landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, what do you think he will do to those farmers? The religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Then Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read this in the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that just as in the parable, you did not stop at sending your son. 
You're a patient and faithful God. In support of your covenant with your people, you sent your prophet, prophet after prophet, to proclaim your message, and yet so often they went unheard. In the fullness of time, you sent your only Son in Jesus, our Savior, who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead to bring us new and everlasting life. How we praise you that you did not give up on us. Yet we often act as though we have given up on you. While you uphold your covenant with us faithfully, we sin and fail to show your grace at work in our lives. Forgive us when we're impatient with others, when we fail to show mercy, when we judge others who may be going through trials different from our own. Renew us in this time that we will start a new week with a clean slate and fresh opportunities to praise you in the word, in the thought, and in the deed that we have. We thank you for the efforts of those who are working to help us return to whatever new normal will be like. Continue to prosper the efforts of medical professionals, frontline workers, and all who seek to keep us safe. We pray for those who are in need of your healing touch. We think today of Bob and Marv and Rosalie and Nick and those who love and care for them. We pray for young people who are graduating from grade 8, from high school, from post-secondary programs, and cannot celebrate as they wish they could. Bless all of them, and as well, all students, all teachers, as they gain a summer break with high hopes for the future, free of Zoom. As we listen for your word today, give us ears ready to listen, hearts ready to act, that we will receive your truth with a desire to grow more into the likeness of Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. True story. When I was in grade four, a major fire took place in our neighborhood. We lived a couple of blocks away, so my parents and I went over briefly to find out why we could smell smoke and see it billowing into the sky. It was my school. The old part of the building, dated back to 1925, was completely engulfed in flames. As it turns out, this, this, is, this is too good. A kid in grade six was the arsonist. Turns out he didn't like school very much, so he kicked in the window of the library, which was in the basement of the building. He threw in some gas and a match, and that's all it took. That old edifice didn't have a chance. I think 44 years later, that boy is still in reform school. He should be. Because he wasn't very smart, and here's why. He chose a Saturday night to burn down that school when he should have been home watching the Habs beat the Leafs. And our principal, who was a very able fella, made all the calls necessary, and we were all in borrowed classrooms on Monday morning. We did not miss a day of school, even though the whole thing burned to the ground. Very disappointing. Well, as I expect you were, I was taught as a child not to play with fire, not to play with matches, lighters, campfires, stoves. I think my grade six pyromaniacal, yeah, that is a word, uh, classmate, I think he missed that lesson from his parents. Why are we taught not to play with fire? Because fire burns, and it burns more than schools. But... Fire does more than burn. 
If you've ever visited a refinery of any sort, you know there's a lot of fire involved. Heck, if you years ago drove down the hill into Hamilton, you could see with your eyes the haze over the, uh, the city and smell with your nose exactly what was involved in a steel mill. But whether you're making railroads or gold bars, a lot of the process is the same. And without refinement, neither would be what it is supposed to be because fire does more than burn. As we come to the third chapter of the book of Malachi, we recall from chapters 1 and 2 that the news was not very good for the people of God. Yes, they had been permitted by their now Persian captors to make their way back to Jerusalem to be able to uh, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. They had praised God for their freedom, but they'd let their passion for the covenant with God grow cold. And even their priests, even their clergy, were taking God for granted and not giving him the respect and awe due his name. They were forsaking their marriages in favor of marrying pagan foreign women. And they bellyached against God. They concluded all of that by questioning whether God had ethical standards and at the end of chapter 2 said, where is the God of justice? In other words, what they were saying is, why aren't things going my way? And now in chapter 3, God is going to let loose with both barrels, albeit in his own gracious way. Judgment is coming, and there will be fire, but it all has a greater purpose, so stay tuned. The passage begins with a, mer- a word indicating immediacy, something immediate. So this is Malachi 3, 1 to 5. He starts by saying, look, which is a, probably another way of saying, just you wait. I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, Sending my messenger. My messenger is a play on the words of uh, play on words with Micah, uh, not Micah, Malachi's name, because Malachi means my messenger. But the next phrase tells us something else. He will prepare the way before me. Now it was a common Eastern tradition for somebody to go ahead of a king or a dignitary to kind of pave the way, to prepare the people for his coming, make way. You know, the king is coming. Uh, The messenger was the harbinger, the sign of what or who was to come. And that may sound familiar to you because Isaiah prophesied, and the people will have known this passage in in, uh, the time of Malachi, prepare the way for the Lord. And Christians see this as the foretelling of the coming of John the Baptist. Let's carry on with the next part of verse 1. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. That is, he will come there and he will continually be there. The messenger of the covenant whom you are looking for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The messenger of the covenant. That is a phrase that appears nowhere else in the Old Testament. What could it mean? Well, if my messenger could be John the Baptist then this could be a prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? This is in reference to the day of the Lord mentioned by several of the prophets. Uh, Who will be able to stand and face him, that is endure, uh, when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire, or other translations say a refiner's fire, that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. The old, tradi- old traditional translations would say a fuller's soap. That A fuller was somebody who cleaned and thickened cloth by uh, using a strong lye soap and kind of beating on it to get it to uh, become better. This is, this is also used in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 22. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. Now, what does somebody who refines metal do? The the process has been refined over the centuries, obviously, but at the heart of it all is fire, heat, a crucible, and the processing of the precious metal over and over and over again until it is absolutely pure. And you know how you can tell 
that it's pure. When the refining process is complete, the refiner can see his reflection in the material. Think about that. This is not just a lesson in metallurgy, and I'll say more about that later. Here's the rest of verse 3. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more, the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem, as he did in the past. At that time, I will put you on trial. I am eager to witness against all And then he makes a list here. Sorcerers, that is, people who practice black arts, which they'll have learned from the Babylonians, and adulterers and liars. Well, they don't need much explanation, do they? Um, And then the Lord says through Malachi that he's going to go after the powerless in society. He says, I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages. That is, day laborers who essentially were worse off than slaves because they, they owned no land, they were reliant day to day for work, and they had no one to care for them. So they were at the, the whim of society. Uh, who oppress widows and orphans. No social welfare system, so uh, God's people had to support the most vulnerable. Or who dis- deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. These were People who had no land, they had no homeland because they'd left due to famine or war. Essentially, we would call these people refugees. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. That is, the people who don't look after the needy, who lie, who are adulterers, who are sorcerers, these are people who don't respect the Lord. And this is how begins the second last chapter of the last book before God goes silent for 400 years. Once Malachi is finished speaking for God, there will be silence from the heavens until John the Baptist comes walking out into town out of the Judean wilderness. And as we've seen so far, the news hasn't been good, but you may have heard some hopeful words in Malachi's prophecy. God is sending his messenger to prepare the way for the Lord. A favorite prophecy of God's people in those days was that of Isaiah. And in Isaiah 40, we heard those very words. He says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. If you're a fan of Handel's Messiah, you've just been hearing all kinds of scripture that inspired that that oratorio today. This is a messianic prophecy, and if you read any reference to John the Baptist in the New Testament, it's going to harken back to that prophecy. Isaiah and now Malachi was promising the coming of the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. In verse 1, he says, The Lord you are seeking will suddenly come into his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming. But as verse 2 says, this is not all good news. Uh, The coming of the Lord would bring judgment. And what would that judgment look like? It would look like fire, blazing fire. But not final judgment kind of fire. This is a refiner's fire. Remember earlier I talked about how you can tell how precious metals are fully refined and into purity. The refiner can see his reflection in the metal. The story of God's people during the intertestamental period, those 400 years between when Malachi finished talking and the the beginning of the gospel stories where John the Baptist shows up, these were times of refinement according to historical documents. But when Jesus came, it was an act of grace. The messenger of the covenant came to bring a new arrangement between God and his people. This would not be another prophet that they would just ignore. This would be the Lord himself in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. In that parable we heard earlier, the evil workers on the farm assaulted and killed the owner's servants one by one, and then the owner sent his son whom he assumed they would respect, but they killed him too. But Jesus wasn't just telling a story. 
He was telling the priests and the teachers of the law that they were the evil workers. They were the ones who killed the servants, and they would be the ones who would kill the son as well. And then Jesus quotes Psalm 118 when he reminds them that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The kingdom of God would be taken from them and given to a nation that would produce fruit. And with that, Jesus actually predicted the birth of the church. In Malachi 2.17, the people asked, Where is the God of justice? Well, in chapter 3, the Lord is saying through the prophet, You want justice? Here it comes. And thus would come judgment that would start with the priests and move to the people. Refinement would take place. Deep cleaning would take place because fire does more than burn. So what do we as 21st century people make of this? Well, let me suggest first that in these days, not necessarily COVID days, but in this era of time generally, we may be enduring a season of refinement. You may have days that you feel as though you're in the crucible and surrounded by fire. So if that's the case, ask yourself some questions. And the first one is this, what is the impurity that is in my crucible? What is the impurity in my crucible? What is it that's bringing me suffering? Why am I in need of refinement? Well, when was the last time you ever had a heart-to-heart with the Lord about the sin in your life. Maybe it's one of those that Malachi noted, sorcery. When we talk about sorcery in in contemporary terms, we're talking about things like dabbling in tarot cards or Ouija boards or crystals or visiting a psychic or practicing yoga for some other reason than just pure stretching exercise. Or adultery. I probably don't need to explain that one to you. But as I mentioned last week, are you remaining faithful to your spouse? Then there's lying. Why did they have to include lying? You know, we can do pretty well at staying away from sorcery and adultery, but oh man, because most of us tell at least one little white lie once in a while, right? How about failing to care for the working poor or the widows and orphans? Or the refugees. See, these last three are not solely the responsibility of the government. There was a time not that long ago when all of these things were solely the responsibility of the church. We've let the government take much of this out of our hands, short of aiding food banks, which we seek to do. But what more can we do in terms of community engagement? I hope to have some answers for that in the fall after our Former intern Christine has completed her community needs assessment that she's doing for St. Paul's this summer. So what's in your crucible? What is it that has placed you in need of purification? Now, the next question might be this that you might want to consider. Uh, What will it take to purify you? What will it take to purify you? If the fire that heats the crucible is what does the purifying, the refining, what does God need to do? How hot does the fire need to get in order for you to be refined so that the Lord can see himself reflected in you? Now, this is a process. Here's the $64 word that you can use in a crossword puzzle of sanctification. That is being made more into the image of Jesus, being made more holy. And it's a painful process. I remember when I was going through a burnout period some years ago, God, by his grace, was able to allow me to see what he was doing in my life even while I was going through it, though it was a difficult and painful process. You know, God could have just thrown me into the fire and left me alone, but he's merciful and gracious and faithful, and instead he put me in the crucible and he refined me. There are ways in which God continues to refine me even to this day, because fire does more than burn. So if you're in a season of refining, trust the Lord to be faithful to bring you through it, knowing that you will be more like him when it's done. And if it's possible by his grace, try to enjoy the process. 
There's so much we can learn about ourselves when we repent of our sin and draw closer to the Lord. Another way we can apply this passage is to look forward from the time of Malachi to the coming of the Lord Jesus. See, a common time of year for this passage to be read, actually, is the season of Advent, the time before Christmas, because it's a passage that anticipates the birth of the Savior, whom Malachi here calls the Messenger of the Covenant. And today, in the time following Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, we also look toward his coming again. A lot of Christians have been praying through the pandemic for the swift return of Jesus. Not just because of the pandemic, of course, but because of racial injustice seen in the world, because of the injustices shown against our First Nations people, because of who gets elected or doesn't get elected to public office, and so on and so on. And I've said it before, we are bombarded with information in ways our parents could never have imagined possible, and it's overwhelming. So yes, it's good to pray for the second coming of Jesus, but it will happen only in his timeline. In the meantime, as you continue to grow faithfully in Christ, try these things out. First, oh, this is tough. Maybe not as tough as the second one, but this is tough. Shut off the TV. Shut off the TV. Doesn't matter what slant on news and popular culture you watch, the goal is to feed your fear. So if you want to chill out, Shut off the TV. Second one, step back from social. If you use social media, you know that it's not all pictures of cats and bacon anymore. Though I do my best for the part about the pictures of bacon, I assure you. Uh, Again, you're going to get one-sided stories, or you're going to be sucked into a vortex of vitriol. Keep in touch with your friends. But when social media starts to cause anxiety, step away. And in place of these things, you can, you know, care for the working poor, the widows and orphans, the refugees, and you can practice spiritual disciplines. Read your Bible. Pray. That's talk to God. Sit in silence so that you can listen to God respond to your reading of Scripture and your prayer. Practice Sabbath. You know, I had some high hopes at the beginning of the pandemic that the concept of Sabbath might possibly have met a resurgence because at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was pretty much forced to slow down. But as things have progressed, we have kind of gone back to that busy pace that we all seem to maintain without realizing that our bodies are made to rest one day a week. You know, God did it at creation. We can do it for ourselves. It's not a, I have to do this. It's, I get to do this. I'm doing this for the good of myself, of my body, of my spirit. There's others, but these give you a starting point. And all of this will ready you and will quicken your heart for the coming of Jesus again. Another thing to consider is something that no flowery book of Bible promises is ever going to mention, but it's all over the New Testament. For followers of Jesus, this is not a good selling feature, I understand, but for followers of Jesus, suffering is normal. In fact, stepping back a bit further, suffering is a normal result of the human condition. The sin that caused the expulsion of humanity from the Garden of Eden brought with it the reality of suffering. God said the man would have to do sweaty work, tilling hard ground, and that the woman would experience pain in childbirth, and that's just the beginning. We live in a time where everybody seems to think they're exempt from suffering. And if they suffer in some way, they stick out their bottom lip and they cry, Where is the God of justice? Well, he was present at creation. He was present in the manger. He was present on the cross. He was present in the empty tomb, which is continually empty. And he is present at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. And he's here in this very moment by the Holy Spirit living inside every follower of Christ, living in and through us. When we are going through a refinement process, that does not mean that God is not present. There's a great story in the Old Testament 
of these three guys that ticked off the king. Their names were Shake the Bed, Make the Bed, and To Bed You Go. No, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how I remember them. Um, and because they refused to bow down and worship the idols the king had set up while they were in exile, the king ordered them thrown into a fiery furnace. And they came out of that fiery furnace unscorched. And the king and his assistants witnessed in that furnace with them a fourth man. He was present with them just as he is present with us. What makes you, if, if, if he would be present with these three men who were faithful in their fiery furnace, a literal fiery furnace, what makes you think that God would not be present with you in whatever time of trial you may face? Accept the time of refinement. Let God do his work in you and realize that his work in you is an act of grace. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Philippi while in prison, I might say, said, I am certain that God who began the good work in you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that for yourself, whatever you're suffering, whatever refinement process you're going through right now, that the Lord is going to bring to completion the work that he himself is doing in you by the time the holy by the time Jesus comes back fire does more than burn the refiner's fire might not be comfortable in the moment but it will produce a shining result it will be a result so pure so perfect that the lord will be able to see his own reflection in you let's pray lord jesus we look for your return, and we pray that you will bring your kingdom to bear on this earth soon. But as we wait, we pray that you will refine us, purify us, make us ready for your return. Make us more like yourself and give us grace in this process of refinement. When we find ourselves in the crucible and the heat feels like too much to bear, be present with us as you were with your people of old. Show us that you can bring much good to us through suffering. And make us ready to face you in the time of judgment, that your grace which has given us faith in you will bring us safely through to the bliss of your eternal presence. Amen. Now, if you find a challenging season is upon you and you'd like some help, uh, feel free to, if you're here, you can talk to me outside today or if uh, you're online there, feel free to fill out the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect and I'll be glad to have a conversation. Be good to encourage you in whatever ways we can. We're going to sing Refiner's Fire, a little song of Canadian content appropriate for the time of year, so please stand if you're able. Thank you. 
God tells us in his word that his steadfast love never ceases, that his mercies never come to an end. And we're invited to respond to his love and mercy with our gifts. Uh, you may make a gift by any of the means listed on the screen, or if you're present in the building, there is a plate that you can use on the way out the door, and envelopes are provided there as well. Uh, we are grateful for all who continue to support God's work in these days. Consuming fire. go into the world today with that consuming fire fanned into flame. May it bring a passion for the name within your heart. May the refining work that God is doing in you be completed by the day of Christ Jesus. And may we understand that all of that is coming to us by grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love today and always. Amen.